Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It's Monday, August 1st. Derek Van Riper, Eno Saris here with you just about 30 hours before the trade deadline as we start recording on this Monday. A few trades have already happened. We'll discuss the deal that sent Luis Castillo to Seattle. We got David Peralta going to the Rays over the weekend. And Eno's got new starting pitcher ranks. We're going to dig into those as well as a few mailbag questions. How's it going for you on this Monday, Eno? It's going good. It's going good. I'm uh, excited for the mayhem. Although, uh, I get this weird feeling it's not going to be as much mayhem as people want. I think there will be plenty of mayhem. I think a <laughs> lot of the deals last year came down in the last 36 hours. We just got a reliever on the move, Scott Efros. Not the reliever I expected to see the Cubs trade going to the Yankees. And as we learned with Clay Holmes last year, when the Yankees seek out a reliever that you didn't expect in the trade for, there might have been a really good reason for it. So we'll we'll see. We'll see what the, comes from Efros joining that Yankees pen. But the Luis Castillo trade, I think, is a great place to start. Seattle didn't necessarily need to be players for Castillo, but it's certainly a smart move given how young the rotation is. I mean, Gilbert and Kirby alone, I think, raise some questions about how much they can work in September and into October without added rotation depth. Now they have what I would say is a playoff caliber rotation in one fell swoop. And Luis Castillo isn't a rental. So they'd have him for 2023 as well. It was a big haul going back to Cincinnati the other way. Noel V. Marte, Edwin Arroyo, Levi Stout, and Andrew Moore, uh, the latter two, both pitchers. But the top two, Marte and Arroyo, pretty clearly going to be impact players as they eventually reach the big leagues. So just from the Seattle perspective first, what did the Mariners get in Castillo and how excited should we be getting him out of great American ballpark? I made an argument uh, on a piece that uh, announced this trade that Luis Castillo is an ace and I think intuitively and using the evidence that I used in that, I agree uh, because he is a guy that pairs a top ground ball rate with a top strikeout rate. I think there was only one other pitcher that had a better strikeout rate and a similar ground ball rate uh, since he's been in the big league. So, you know, when you are, when you have that sort of a unicorn setup, uh, I think you you get into the ace dumb. Um, if you start looking at like Fangraph's war, he's pretty close. I think he's like top 17. Um, and uh, if you just look at his arsenal, he's, you know, he's kind of flattened out the four seamer a little bit this year so that it's got a little bit more ride. And that gives him uh, what looks like an, an R model, like a good, uh, like above average four seam with an elite changeup and a really good slider. So that's, you know, three pitches that are really good by stuff and by command. So uh, there's only, uh, I think there's only like, like 14 other uh, pitchers that have that combination of three pitches that are above average by stuff and command um, three or more. So you, you kind of, you kind of keep getting grouped in these like 15, 16, like he keeps coming up there. I, I ranked him 22nd though. Um, and I think that part of that is just because he still pitches in Cincinnati. And so I'm still going to hold that park factor against him. Um, so that, you know, that alone should move him up a little bit. Um, and I'm trying to look at the rankings and see who I would have below him. And I think Christian Javier, you know, has been turning into a bit of a five, five and dive guy. There's also some risk with Lance McCullers back at some point that he goes back to the bullpen. So I'm going to move Luis Castillo ahead of Javier Alec Manoa kind of had that injury. He's also been losing some stuff, so it's possible I would move him ahead of that. Him, Spencer Strider is a risk to go to the bullpen, uh, so I'd have him pretty close to him, if not above him. So I think I could move Luis Castillo with this uh, from 22nd to something like 17th. So that's pretty close to ace territory, you know, for fantasy uh, and for real life purposes. Uh, I think that's a uh, that word ace is uh, kind of defined differently by everybody. It's like kind of a right. It's just uh, some people are like, there's five aces, you know. I know one when I see one. I know one when I see one. So are there thirty aces? Because you know you have to. Every team has to have a number one. Nope. <laughs> yeah. So where where does ace them li- li- end? Because I've got if I have Luis Castillo seventeen. 
Um, you know, going up into him, Cease, Woodruff, Rodon, Urias, Kershaw, Castillo. Where does the line for you end? He's kind of on the line, I guess. Yeah, I, I was kind of making the argument pro. I think he's probably in. I think most of that group, if not all that group, would be considered aces for me. I think there are. I think there's a difference between an ace and an elite pitcher. That that's like the next tier up, right? Within your group of that's aces, like you have some five. elite players. That's your top five, top three, top so, seven, yeah. whatever, whatever extra thing, extra strikeouts, lower walk rate, lower home run rate, whatever the differences are. That's what I think you have at the very, very top like of the world list. So series game one starter or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. The the pitchers that you'd put in the argument for game seven, your season's on the line, stakes couldn't be higher. Who do you want taking the ball? Castillo's not in that conversation, but like perennial all star type starter. I mean, I think that's what I would mm-hmm. describe him as right now. It's interesting that you know for pitching half his games in Great American Ballpark to this point in his career. Luis Castillo hasn't had a bad home run rate really since 2018. 2019 was pretty much like a league average home run rate, and that was a year where home runs were up. And all the way back to the pandemic short in 2020 season, he's been even better than that. So I don't know how much of a a boost he's going to get in terms of actual results, but it's a safer floor putting him in Seattle than there was in Cincinnati. And I wonder if in some shallow leagues there was always that temptation in a tough home matchup to possibly not use him, right? It was just uh, one of those rare things. Oh, we're in an 18 league and he's home and it's uh, the Dodgers in town. So we're not going to use him. That pretty much goes away completely in Seattle. Like any little doubts in those shallow, shallow leagues are totally gone. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Castillo ends up being a little overdrafted in 2023. If we're thinking ahead to the future, just because I think people might overcorrect for the move into the park that used to be Safeco. What are they? T-Mobile field now? Stop changing sponsors, stadiums, you jerks. <laughs> well, I was just checking real quick. He's got uh, uh, 11% usage. This is something's wrong here. That doesn't add up to 100. <laughs> How could this not add up to 100? It's very strange. Um, well, I'm just trying to see if he uses a sinker more at home versus away. I'll just look at raw sinker users, 1,400. A uh, little bit of evidence that he uses a sinker a little bit more at home. Just wanted to see if it if it was like uh, he was using that to suppress the homers. Mm-hmm. It looks like he uses a sinker and change up a little bit more at home uh, than he does away. He can he can be a fastball slider guy or he can be a sinker change up guy. So it's kind of cool to have both of those in one place. I think it, I, I think it was probably worth it. You know, they have these you have this uh, baseball trade values calculator that's out there. And um, people use that to say, oh, massive overpay by Seattle. But I would say that this deadline, there's Castillo, possibly Carlos Rodon, uh, and then uh, Frankie Montas and Nate Ivaldi available, right? Given the years of control, Luis Castillo is clearly the best of that four. Yes. And therefore fairly scarce as a resource, right? Here's a guy with another year of control who's the best pitcher available. Maybe your calculator doesn't quite handle that 100% correctly. Your calculator is <laughs> not thinking about the four or five year, 20 million per year contract you have to give someone in free agency to fill that spot next year either. I, I think this is a great return for Cincinnati. I'm not trying to, yeah. to downplay that whatsoever. I mean, I think the Reds have pretty clearly committed to a young core that should start to arrive probably in 2024. You know, I don't think we're going to see most of their their most talented position player prospects before then. But you think about Marte and Arroyo joining Ellie De La Cruz, who just popped up at number eight. Keith Law had an updated top 60 that went up, I think, just uh, earlier in the day on Monday. Uh, Noel V. Marte is 12th in that list. Arroyo is an easy top 100 guy if that list were bigger. I think there are some lists that are updated that have him in the top 50 already. And then Cam Collier, who slipped to 18th overall, might be one of the biggest steals of the first round of this year's draft as well. So you could see that group, and you can get pretty excited about that. They do have some young pitching left. I mean, Tyler Malley probably seems like a a lock to get traded at this point, but they at least have a plan. I think my beef with the Reds going all the way back to the Winker-Suarez trade was I thought they were good enough to be competitive 
the way they were. But seeing how they're starting to make this work, I can understand because they've chosen a direct direction quickly and are executing pretty well in these deals, I feel like it's it's okay. It's just not the way you want your team to play because you're throwing away two seasons to get to that next window. Yeah, but you know, at least they've developed some players that uh, can get them, you know, like top end prospects. There are player there are teams that maybe are in a worse place. You know, 100%. I think the Nationals are in a worse spot than yeah. the Reds right now, for sure. And they have Juan Soto still to trade, so a lot could could change or if they but even after that i feel like sort of organizationally after a soto trade you give them three or four top prospects those will be the first top four prospects to have you know <laughs> this will be the best prospects they have immediately and then i just don't trust the the player development engine there to get the most out of them and there are pieces in cincinnati that I, that i i still uh i think i respect and i think they've been pretty good at turning out pitchers as difficult as that park is uh, to, to pitch in, you know? So I think Mally is a good example. I mean, there's a guy that, uh, you know, it took a while to get to there and he maybe not have the best season right now, but uh, that's a pretty good outcome for his skill set. He was a guy that was a command guy and was, you know, low nineties. Now he's mid nineties and has some stuff and the command's still there. And I think they've found their way kind of forward with him. So, I don't know. I, I, it's not exactly how you want to see it done, when especially when they seem to be building towards something at, at that one point. But uh, at least the uh, the band aid was ripped off quickly, <laughs> and they seem to have some players to be excited about again. Yeah, a quick retooling, I think, is the best way to describe the plan right now in Cincinnati. Uh, the Rays picked up an outfielder. I think we were both pretty confident David Peralta was going somewhere. It does make a lot of sense that he ends up in Tampa Bay. Who loses with the move of Peralta into that outfield mix? Hmm. As a lefty, maybe the newest call up there um, in Tampa, Luke Rayleigh. Yeah, I think Rayleigh is the guy that was playing a lot before the trade that stayed on the roster, right? And Josh Lowe got bumped right off the roster, even though his July was actually decent 277, 348, 410, 27.2% K rate. For low, so maybe starting to figure some things out at the big league level. But Rayleigh, prior to this trade, looked like a deep league pickup. And as soon as this happened over the weekend, I think Rayleigh kind of fell into that three to four starts per week role that makes him tough to use outside of mono leagues. Wonder if we're yeah, I I even canceled a bit on Rayleigh on Sunday due to the uh due to concerns. And I don't know exactly when the Peralta trade. I think it was after the Peralta trade, right? The Peralta trade came through on Sunday. Saturday or Sunday, Saturday. I yeah, think the weekend was a blur. So I cancel. I canceled a Luke Rayleigh claim in AL labor because I was. I was like, eh, you know, uh, I only have like fifteen dollars left. <laughs> I'm not going to spend it on this. Um, uh, another thing that concerns me about Rayleigh uh, going forward is that um, he's not really playing center field, and he hasn't in years. So Rayleigh and Peralta. I don't think you really want Peralta in center. So is. Are Rosa Reina going to play some in center or what's the plan in center? Is it Brett Phillips and Roman Quinn? Did he stay on the roster? Is Roman Quinn on the roster? I think he Roman is. Quinn is still on that roster. Yes. Uh, that's so weird because I, I mean, I feel like you can do better. I mean, I like Brett Phillips as a person and he seems like he's an interesting guy, but he's got a 42 WRC plus right now. So I don't know. Maybe they're maybe they've got some good internal news about Bargo that we just haven't heard yet because he has resumed running as of last week. I guess if he's running, then you're just like just hold on tight till Margot comes back, and then we'll have a Margot Phillips center field. Yeah, I don't think a Rosa Reina has started a game in center field all season. Looking through, it's all left field, a couple DH starts, and I. Th- think maybe a turn in right like once recently as yes he started in right field on sunday that might have been the first time all season so Peralta definitely an area of need. field since 2016 so i mean he's won some gold gloves in the corners but i am just i'm just interested in what's happening in center you know 
I, I don't think that part is figured out. And maybe maybe they'll just call it Bruhan and put him in center, or maybe maybe uh, Margot is closer than we think. And in fact, if if that does happen, Margot is a righty, but I think it would be kind of more of a situation where Margot is the starter and Brett Phillips is the backup. I get the sense that maybe they're not done. They're going to try and find one more outfielder, someone who can play center field, and then if they don't find that player for the there price was, that they like, maybe Josh Lowe comes back up and is at least a good defender in center field for them. Yeah, they, there was uh, one uh, rumor linking them to Michael A. Taylor, I think. Yeah, I mean, someone like that, a glove first sort of player that ultimately shouldn't, shouldn't up a lot much. of time. Yeah, and maybe he doesn't, maybe Phillips doesn't start against every righty. And uh, Taylor starts against all lefties and uh, half of the righties. It would be sad if we get to the deadline on Tuesday and Peralta is the best position player that changed leagues for AL only <laughs> leagues. I held the hammer. Oh, and I'm getting David Peralta as the, the runner up. And, to and, and because it's the Rays too, like he won't he won't be playing as much as he did probably. Yeah, a little more mixing and matching going on there. As mentioned up top, you had new starting pitcher rankings go up for subscribers to The Athletic. If you don't have a subscription, you can get one for a dollar a month for the first six months at theathletic.com slash rates in barrels. I had a few questions for you. Not not of the, uh, I don't know. The, they're not you idiot. Questions. How did you do, how could you do this? How could you rank this guy here and this guy here? Yeah, yeah, they're not they're not mean questions. They're just <laughs> no, general right. curiosity questions. I think there were a few surprises in the top thirty for me. I think Christian Javier being at eighteen. I, I like Christian Javier. I think a lot of people who listen to this show like Christian Javier. I want to know what has changed in his arsenal that could give us some confidence in his ability to have some long term success in a starting role. Because previously he was that sort of bridge reliever, and there was uncertainty about how he would do having to turn the lineup over two and eventually three times. Yeah, I just saw enough command, actually, because I think the stuff, the fastball slider stuff has is pretty well established and I just wanted to see enough command. And, you know, he does have the worst command in my top 30, uh, but it isn't. Um, I thought with the stuff number as high as it was, uh, it would work. I might have been too aggressive on him. Uh, it, it also is, uh, he was projected uh, by the bat to be a top third, like a 13th best starting pitcher. Mm -hmm. And I did want to hew closer to projections, uh, this late in the season because they're pretty good at summing up, uh, the quality of opponent going forward, just the overall results. And at this point in the season, uh, there are more peripherals that are even more important than, than stuff and command. Uh, because at this point, uh, strikeouts minus walks uh, uh, are uh, give you more information than stuff in command, uh, stuff in location. Um, so, uh, you know, I kind of uh, saw that, pro that projection for him at 13. I've moved him down a little bit due to concerns about the bullpen and how deep he was going into games, but maybe I didn't move him down enough. But he's... I've actually have him five lower than his projection, you know? So like, I, I agree with you on the concerns. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I think if, if you group them with other pitchers that have been between roles and they're having a lot of success as starters, I mean, you could maybe lower them and put them in a group with Nestor Cortez or move Nestor Cortez up and put Cortez with Javier. I think that's how my mind tends to work. I always group these players really close together. I think the other thing with, with Javier is like when we first talked about him as a call-up on this show, probably what, two, three years ago now, I think, the arsenal was supposed to be excellent, and it's very good. I think the thing that surprised me is that he doesn't throw the curveball more than he does. 8% usage on the curveball seems pretty low. Is there anything about that pitch? Is it the command of that pitch in particular that maybe keeps him from throwing that more often to give him that second consistent breaking ball? What's uh, amazing is that Stuff Plus hates that knuckle curve. Hmm. He gets a 72 Stuff Plus on it. In fact, the locations are what make it useful at all. So I don't know if that's a counterintuitive uh, situation there, but I think the changeup is a complete lack of command of the changeup. He's a 96 Stuff Plus changeup and then an 81 command uh, location on it. So, so yeah, the changeup is not really an option. Um, 
you know, he reminds me a little bit of Logan Gilbert, I guess, where you've got this excellent fastball with good, with good, good ride and good extension. Uh, you figured out a slider to go with it. And uh, the, the third pitch is surprisingly poor based on the eye test because Logan Gilbert's curve actually rates similar to this. And Logan Gilbert's curve was always supposed to be his best pitch uh, coming up. So, yeah, a little bit of a Logan Gilbert situation there. And I do have Logan Gilbert uh, a few down from him. So, I don't know. I, he's right there with Strider. And it's like, these guys, I think, are going to be excellent. They're going to be in. I don't know how many innings they're going to get. Yeah, that's the tough thing about the young pitchers. Talked about a couple episodes ago. You just, especially for teams that are going to the playoffs, how are they going to get from here to October if they want those guys to still have starting roles and, and full capacity starting roles? Once they get to the, the postseason, the Astros are supposedly shopping Jake Odorizzi, and it's like, is it to save money so they have another deal on the table that's going to cost them something, or to just replenish prospects while they're s- sending prospects out on another deal? It seems like too tricky. Yeah, making one move because you think you're going to make another, you have to make sure that other move also comes through. Otherwise, you end up missing the depth that you need to get. From here to there, I think right? Exactly you still need to Odorizzi get. To, you still need to get to the postseason. I think you. I think you want to keep odors around for, you know, to getting there. I think I would rather go to a six man rotation and just keep all my guys stretched out, uh, and then have have multiple options in the postseason. There were you, you, everyone goes to like three innings in the postseason. If you have or four innings in the postseason, if you have more guys that are stretched out, you have more options to to go for innings. So. I'd keep Odorizzi around, even if it means going to a six-man rotation. I want to ask you about Chris Bassett. I think among your top 20 starters, he's got the second lowest stuff plus number. A little surprised to see Zach Wheeler uh, just a tick lower than Bassett right now. But what's enabled Bassett to reach this level? I thought we saw all of his ceiling during his time in Oakland. I thought if he topped out in the top 40 among starting pitchers, that'd be about as high as he could go. So... That was just one of those names. I was like, whoa, hey, Eno's in on Bassett, like kind of in a big way. I mean, team context is obviously very good. Ballpark is obviously very good, but there's probably more to it than just those factors if you have Bassett this high. Yeah, there's been a a couple things. Uh, His velo has been actually kind of going up uh, since uh, the beginning of the season. And also his pitch mix has changed where – He's finally throwing that curveball that Art Stuff Plus loves so much and that he thinks people would sit on. There's no way anyone's ever going to sit on a 72-mile-an-hour curveball, Chris Bassett. It's just not going to work. They'd be blown out of the water on every other pitch you had. <laughs> um, so uh, he's throwing the, 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 the curveball the most he's ever thrown it, I think. Yeah, this looks like the most he's ever thrown it for a month or close to it at 16%. He's thrown the slider more than he's ever thrown it at uh, nearly a quarter of the time. Um, and uh, the sinker usage has come down and the four seam usage has come up. So, um, you know, there's some pitch mix changes that have made him uh, uh, more, pro- uh, more uh, attractive as a pitcher actually over the course of the season. Um, there are uh, some, some movement changes too. Um He's gotten, uh, you know, more drop on his sinker um, and more sort of drop on most of his pitches generally. Um, and then you look over here, interestingly enough, Wheeler and uh, Bassett, who have the lowest stuff plus numbers uh, full season wise in uh, the top 20. They are both also the biggest risers in stuff plus over the last 400 uh, pitches which is something that I tracked this uh, this time because I wanted to get a sense of uh, how they what direction they were moving in with their stuff. There's a little bit of uh, there's a little bit of, of proof in our in our data work that uh, the last 400 pitches of stuff plus are slightly more predictive than full season numbers. So basically you got Wheeler and Bassett getting healthy, getting right at the right time. I think, and I think they're there. That's why I have Wheeler eight and the bat has him 12. Um, I have bats at 20 and the bat has him 22. Um, so the bat, the projection system likes bats at two, but I, I, I was, I thought it was willing to, to bump him up a couple based on the fact that, you know, in the last 400 pitches, Chris Bassett has a 104 stuff plus 
Nice. That's that's nice. That that puts him right there with Musgrove. And in fact, Musgrove has been losing stuff and has a 101. That's why I moved Bassett ahead of Musgrove right there. It was just looking at the last 400. Then Wheeler uh, in the last 400 has a 102. But he's he's been this, the, you know, Wheeler and Thor, I think, are some of the most misunderstood pitchers in baseball. Where, you know, people sometimes see the velo or remember, you know, what they used to be or whatever and think these guys, I've, I've, I've seen it said that they're, they're, they're hurlers, they're throwers, not pitchers. Mm -hmm. And Wheeler has excellent command. In fact, if Wheeler didn't have excellent command, he wouldn't be anywhere as good as he is. Um, and, uh, you know, Syndergaard is hold, just barely holding on based on his command. I mean, the fact that he's got five okay pitches in command that... He's more closer to a Ryu these days than he is to like a glass now, you know? True. No, and, and that's that's a pretty big step down if you're making that sort of decline. But for Wheeler, he's still got the stuff. So, you know, I, 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 I was bullish on Wheeler and that's one where I was, you know, given where he is in the rankings, you know, having a four difference off of the bat is a big deal, you know? You want to do the breaking news jingle? Oh, do, 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 breaking news, breaking news. Oh, my goodness. What? <laughs> yeah. wow. I saw it before you did. So oh, I, I was like, whoa, like, this, this is Josh actually happening. Hater, Josh Hader to the Padres. The Padres get their closer. Oh, I wonder if this takes them out of the Juan Soto mix. Mm, I don't think it does. So Ken Rosenthal, about 10 had minutes ago, had they were close. Jeff Passan of ESPN has the confirmation and the return. And I think the way this trade is set up, so it's Josh Hader going to San Diego, Taylor Rogers, who has been struggling recently, going back to Milwaukee. Brewers think they can fix Taylor Rogers. Lefty pitching prospect Robert Gosser, outfielder Asturi Ruiz, and did Nelson Lamette going back to Milwaukee oh. as part of this trade. So a really interesting gamble by the Brewers to make this move. Hader has struggled a bit recently, which is, you know, probably just a blip on the radar given how good the stuff is and how long he's been elite. The thing to keep in mind is that Hader was also going to be a free agent at the end of 2023. So aside from a big bump well, coming Rogers to Rogers is a free agent any of this year, I think. Yeah, I, well, I think with the Brewers, you look at this team and say, if we can get more young talent that we could either flip in a different deal or just makes us better because young talent's a bit of a problem in Milwaukee. Uh, like they might run. use that to go acquire, might use Ruiz in particular to go acquire a bat. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think if this is the tricky, is this one move to like not lose ground, but then to have pieces to then go make up ground somewhere Dude, else. I kind of like this for uh, the Padres, man. Ruiz does not hit the ball hard and he's a little bit like he's already playing the corners. Like he's not like a standout uh, defensive guy in center. I, he's not my favorite prospect. And so you're giving up that prospect. So I do think that the Brewers probably have this in mind for Taylor Rogers. I noticed this thanks to uh, a reader. Um, so Taylor Rogers went to a sweeper, right? He, he added three inches of sweep on his slider. However, he lost two inches, uh, two uh, ticks of velo, and that happens. There's a trade off between horizontal movement and velo. It's not always a good trade off, though, if you lose a certain it amount. It was not. He w in the in the first two months of the season when he had the uh, when he had the regular slider that he had before, he had a 128 stuff plus. In the last two months of the season with the sweeper, he had a 102 stuff plus. So. I, I think the Padres know all about this. I mean, the Brewers know all about this, and I know Ruben Niebla probably knows about it too but you know maybe there's just a maybe he's like no we'll stick with the sweeper you know this is going to be good eventually uh maybe you just maybe they have different stuff plus numbers maybe neva is looking at different numbers but everyone has different models it's, it's possible uh but i would i would assume that the brewers uh, say to to rogers hey let's go back to your old slider we'd rather have it be 85 and and you can and also he lost a little bit of command of it, right? And command can be as important in my numbers and some of the research more important than stuff for sliders because can if you can put a slider on the outside corner, does it matter what shape it is? You know what I mean? If you look at it, it's going to drop if you can put it right there. And what's been happening with Rogers is he's been hitting guys in the back foot when he tries to back foot that slider because it has more sweep and he's just not used to it. 
So maybe the Brewers say, hey, maybe the sweeper is better overall, but uh, right now we need you to command this. Anyway, it, it strikes to me that there's that meme out there, which is like, um, what is it? The Rays do uh, you know, make 15 moves that make themselves uh, marginally worse at, at, and, and a cheaper team. <laughs> and everyone goes, yay. <laughs> I get a little bit of that with this, with this Padres deal. I mean, is the Major League team better? After this deal, for the Brewers, uh, they're not worse. Josh Hader doesn't pitch more than one inning anymore. He hasn't done it in years, right. so you're getting quite a bit back by by adding Lamette just as another reliever. I, I mean, right now the Brewers bullpen depth is a concern, so getting another guy in there, Lamette's probably their third best reliever upon arrival. Oh, okay. So things are getting a little bit more dire than I realized in the back end of that uh, Milwaukee bullpen. Well, because they've, they've had a few injuries. Yeah, you know, Boxberger isn't quite as good as he was a year ago. I, I mean, health is obviously the main concern with Lamette, but who do you trust more, Trevor Gott, Brad Boxberger, or Denelson Lamette in the seventh inning? Yeah, so probably an upgrade there. I mean, I think it, I know being down on on Ruiz. That's you know not necessarily something that makes them immediately better. It doesn't solve the offensive problems. How much do we like Robert Gosser as a pitching prospect? I guess that's part of the question, too. I don't yeah, think it makes them a lot worse. I think it gives them more depth and kind of balances out their bullpen a bit, even if their A bullpen is not as good as it was when Hader was at his best. And if Ruiz, you know, one of the problems with the Brewers' uh, offense right now is strikeouts, right? Like yeah. they can, they can, they can hit for power, but they strike out a fair amount. Ruiz offers at least that sort of tantalizing. Maybe he could strike out seventeen to eighteen percent of the time in the major leagues and put up like slightly below average uh, power. That uh, that would be a very different player than they have, right? <laughs> I mean, oh yeah, they, just, they don't really have that player. So uh, sometimes, though, you know, sometimes. You you make you have the best of intentions, and you're saying, "Hey, I want, I want lineup diversity. I want a guy who can make contact." And sometimes you end up with Rymel Tapia. So, in fact, that name just gives me the shivers when I look at Ruiz, dude. <laughs> that very well could be like, the type <laughs> of player that he is. Yeah, I think the interesting thing here from the Padres' perspective is the names that have been bundled together over and over in the possible they didn't give up. trades. They did not they're, give those guys they're up. They're all there. Yeah. So the Padres are clearly not done. Obviously, the Brewers aren't really done yet either. They're going to add some kind of bat, even if it's only a depth bat. So both both of these teams, I think, are incomplete think in terms of made, what they're doing. But these yeah. are these are it's an interesting trade for a I like it a little reason. better for the Padres. I like it a little better for sure. the Padres just because I think yeah, but maybe you convinced me that that I could, I can understand the thinking a little bit more on the on the Brewer side, but um, uh, what I like about it for the Padres is I think they have a, a decent depth in that bullpen because they have guys like Pierce Johnson, Tim Hill. You know, there's some some guys are hurt and some guys are coming back, whatever it is. But they have guys. They just you know I think they they saw that they didn't have the guy that they wanted at the very end. Yeah, uh, so it's, funny, it's the opposite problem. Yeah, so it kind of is like, okay, we'd rather take the upgrade there because we think that Wilson, Pierce Johnson, those guys, Robert Suarez, we have guys who can pitch the eighth, you know, and the seventh, but we really want a, do- a dominant ninth inning guy. So I'm, I'm, I'm on board with this, man. If Devin Williams moves into solo closer role, uh, that's the best closer at some birds on the wire all season in every league. And I mean, it's just, it's not even close. He's, he's been lights out and it, I'm without curious. that, without that slider change, I, I think I'm going Williams. You know, right. he's also in house, and then you can you what you say to Rogers is, hey, we're we're taking you out. You're not in the closer role for now. You can you maybe get it back, but we need you to maybe go back to your old slider and let's and let's let's see what we can do. They might use this bullpen the more more like the way the Twins use their bullpen. Like they might kind of Some go that route. They might ways. become a committee team where it's two or three guys finishing games when. They, Seventh, eighth, and ninth inning guys, four different guys get those outs, and we mix and match based on what we need. Hater didn't seem as interested in doing that, especially the multi inning thing. Maybe they can use Rogers for four or five outs on occasion. That gives them a little bit more flexibility. The word of the deadline always flexibility. But also, I think with Williams, I, I think you really have to be careful with his health. 
you know? Uh, and so yeah, I think you don't want, you don't want to go back to back to back with Williams. I, don't, I, I bet you he's never done it in his career. And maybe that's the other wrinkle here is you say, well, we had a guy we were using in that role. Now we can use Williams in that role and Williams might be just as good as Hater is now. So let's just get more, more pieces. And maybe we can put somebody else who can go back to back to back every once in a while in, in the eighth, you know, if we need it. So yeah, and I like lot. the idea that Lamette is actually uh, an improvement in, in the back end for them. So they're kind of just, you know, evening out the talent a little bit and, and getting a, a pitching, uh, getting two prospects uh, that are at least interesting in, in Gosser and uh, Ruiz. They might not be there long. Who knows? We'll see if there's another move coming here before we sign off. Back over to the pitching ranks for a bit. John Gray. Year one as a member of the Rangers has me pretty excited that if he can be a top 30 starting pitcher at this stage of his career, we can still have hope for Herman Marquez. The thing that really stands out to me with Gray is a couple things. The velocity is up a full tick on the fastball from where it was last year and almost two ticks from where it was back in 2020. So he's getting better results on the fastball compared to last season, especially slider was good last year. It's still good now. It's weird that the changeup is better. Has there anything? Has anything changed with the movement profile, the shape of that pitch that would would explain why that's worked really well? He doesn't throw it that much; throws it ten percent of the time. But it's, it's a pretty big jump from where that pitch was a season ago. I mean, I, uh, mostly what I saw in the ranking was that um, you know this. Uh, I think he's finally really getting. Um, to use the two sliders, he's kind of, I think he's using the sweeper more um, and he's using the slider more than he ever has. Uh, so he's kind of a 50, 50 uh, four seam and fastball. Uh, but you're right. The, he's using the change up almost as much as he ever has before. And I just, I don't see anything that is super obvious in terms of uh, what's changed on the pitch because uh, he throws it about as hard as he did last year. Uh, it has a little bit more fade this year. Uh, so that's good news. I guess two inches more fade um, and uh, about the same drop as last year. So it's a little bit more side to side than it has been in the past. But there's just something uh, also that he just seems to believe in it and he's throwing it more. It's just confidence, you know. Um, in terms of uh, what the the model thinks about his changeup, um, you know, I think it's it's going to be mostly all about his fastball side up. Yeah, his changeup is a 81 stuff plus. Uh, but, you know, I think an 81 stuff plus type pitch that, that he locates about average is going to be enough to at least keep people guessing. You see somebody keyholing you too much. You see somebody really locking into your slider or locking into your four seam or something. Then psh, here comes a changeup. You didn't expect that. And if I can throw it in the zone, then you're probably going to take it and I get a, I get a free strike. So. I would say generally it's been about the improvement in the stuff for his four seam and the sweeper. Uh, but he uh, is on a, a cool a list here of the biggest stuff plus risers that I think people would be interested in, in hearing a uh, Graham Ashcraft. Uh, uh, you know, the the, yeah. The model, um, the model uh, does not love his stuff, but loves his command and uh, ha has been sort of reacting positively to his stuff over the last 400. So, um, uh, you know, it still says 98 stuff plus, which is a little bit weird for somebody who throws as hard as Ashcraft does. Um, and maybe the model is just not getting it completely right because Ashcraft uh, throws like a really hard four seam and a really hard cutter. And it's kind of hard to just sort of determine which one is his primary fastball. And you you kind of define everything off the primary fastball. So which one is it? If it's the cutter, maybe the, maybe the stuff plus is higher. We, we don't really have the ability right now to just like take our finger and point in the model and be like, no, change it to this as the primary fastball. It's kind of just an algorithm. Um, but um, I, I remain interested in him. I'm a little bit more likely to use him on the road just because I don't. You know, the price for a bad start at home is just higher. <laughs> um, but uh, that's that's Ashcraft is number one. Do you want me to kind of do the other guys real quick or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Throw them out there. Flexen uh, two with a uh, plus nine stuff. Plus uh, he has changes. Uh, he has a new slider. He mm. didn't really ever have a slider before. Now he has a slider. 
uh, the model love slider. So uh, <laughs> that seems like a good move for Chris Flexen. I think he might be moving a little bit. Like he's a two start guy that I picked up last week that I didn't drop. You know? Okay. Yeah. He's kind of moving from that to that. Charlie Morton, the stuff is up. The command is down a little bit, but I just, he's a stuffist from the beginning. So I'm happy for, to see that. I know there hasn't been, there's been a couple bad starts, but I still believe in him. Hunter Green. Uh, is next and then Cal Quantrill our man went from 89 to 96 uh, still kind of a, a poor line across the board with a 93 pitching plus uh, I still don't really believe in him John Gray right there Kyle Wright uh, amazingly Dakota Hudson going from 68 to 73 still don't like him uh, <laughs> from Valdez is there uh, I think he's adding a cutter I told you Zach Wheeler and Chris Bassett were on this part of the list. Uh, Sonny Gray, Luis Castillo. Uh, and then Zach Plesak may have something to do with why the Mets are into him. Uh, he's been showing a 103 stuff plus in his last 400. So uh, that's a, that's decidedly better than he was doing earlier in the season. So maybe the, the, the Mets see something there and think uh, he could be a good back end uh, starter for them. So that's the biggest risers in stuff plus. Nice list. I thought there might be a chance we'd see Nick Lodolo on the list and you explain the number of pitches needed. And I think that would explain why he couldn't have been. He on has the list. like 400 pitches for the year. <laughs> yeah. And I, I wanted to bring up Lodolo because I was starting to think about either young pitchers, if I were playing for the future, that'd be trading for right now, or even just maybe undervalued rest of season pitchers. I think Lodolo might fit both of those criteria. And I, I think. It's three pitches, and the model really likes him overall. I mean, it's fastball, curveball, changeup. I like that even the third pitch throws it 17% of the time. So it's not the the John Gray scenario where he has that and he kind of just throws it just to keep people off the fastball. It's No, this is actually a third pitch that I want to use. The ratios right now in eight starts are pretty ugly. 423 ERA, 157 whip, but 54 Ks and 38 in the third innings to this point for Lodolo. And I think because he's missed time already, Compared to all the well, other young starters. Everyone's nervous about his health, right? Yeah, everyone's nervous about his health, but he'll just oh, he might have like more innings starter. left. Yeah. Tank. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think you get five plus innings every single time out. I mean, the same kinds of things you're worried about with Ashcraft are, are there with Lodolo, but I think Lodolo's better to the point where I'm really not that it's worried wider, about most of his home starts. It's a wider mix. He has more pitches. You know? Yeah. There's I think a, he's, a, he's a better Way player. more he can do. Pretty sure he's a better pitcher. <laughs> Fairly um, confident in that one, yeah. So yeah. I, I can see Lodolo being the kind of guy that's not even a top 50 pitcher right now, probably for anybody, who makes a massive leap over these final two months. And hey, if you have him in your lineup, you're rostering him while he's doing that, good things are likely to happen. So I I just see him as a good target right yeah. now if you're trying to improve your pitching short-term or long-term. The, the two biggest uh, differences that I have maybe in my top 75 between... Um, maybe the three biggest differences between the bat ranking and uh, and between my ranking are Lodolo, Aaron Ashby, and Drew Rasmussen. We've talked about Drew Rasmussen a lot, but he's also a stuff plus gainer right now. Um, and this obviously a little bit harder to use them in certain leagues, like a quality start league. Uh, but I think all three of those are guys that I would buy low on. They're, the model loves them. Um, I think their teams are going to use them. What is your uh, standpoint on Ashby's uh, end of season innings and and how that's going to look? Similar to Lodolo, missed a little less time. I think they're going to just let him work like a regular starter. I mean, the way they've been they pitching him the last him couple too, of weeks. Right? Yeah, I mean, you're talking about the previous career high. I think when we looked at this a couple weeks ago, 126 innings back in 2019. He's at one. 112 and a third. Wow, it is hard to do innings decimal math on the fly because <laughs> it's not. Yeah, so they can go to, he can go to 150. He can go 160, I think. You know, I think they'll use him. Maybe a couple of skips in September and then uh, another push as they're, the as they're, you know, if they're, if they're definitely in the playoffs and they want to use him a certain time. Yeah. But, but you can uh, deal with that at the time. This and is he's not better be than his, he's better than his results. Like Lodolo, right? He's better than his results have been, I think. Yeah, there was one start in particular I was watching. I think it was even before the IL stint. He got babbit pretty good by the Nationals. And it's one of those lines you look at, you're like, wow, that was brutal. And it, it wasn't a good start, but it wasn't nearly the disaster that the results make it out to be. And I think when you're still talking about 
80 and two thirds innings, one bad start still wreaks pretty good havoc on those ratios. Yeah, and, and any risk of him losing his job uh, when Peralta comes back? Because Peralta's back any day now. I don't think so. I mean, I think with the the Hauser injury as well, I think mm. Hauser kind of pitched his way out of the equation anyway. I know he's throwing and making his way back, but I think Hauser's more of a bridge guy that they would use. Like Hauser, they I might think is... need him in the bullpen. I mean, if they're if Lamed is their third best pitcher in the back there, they may they may really want Hauser in the bullpen. I think Alexander has options. You know, Alexander mm-hmm. and Small are up and down guys. So even with Peralta in there, it's Burns, Peralta, it's Burns, Woodruff, Peralta, Ashby, Lauer. You know, yeah, and that's the rotation. So anyway, those are those are guys that pop for me, and I agree with you 100. And Lodolo. <clears throat> might even be more acquirable than Ashby, you know, depending on what sort of numbers the other person is looking at and what what they expect. You know, at least Ashby's been healthier, right? Lodolo you know, has this like aspect of oh, he could get injured at any time, which is is true, but maybe overrated in this case. We had an actual question about <laughs> Graham Ashcraft that came in. One of our loyal listeners, OJ, was just wondering if the Graham Ashcraft arsenal with that high velocity cutter gives him a path to being a future Emmanuel Class A. What is it about his pitch that gives him such a poor stuff plus number compared to Class A, who is one of the best players in the model? Yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, I think with Class A, uh, one, of the, one thing you'll notice is that he doesn't really throw a four seam, so the model doesn't have any... Uh, problem deciding which one is his his main his primary pitch you know what i mean Mm -hmm. um because i think right now uh with the cutter they are uh this the model is saying that his sinker is maybe his primary pitch you know uh and then defining the cutter off the sinker whereas i think it's his cutter is his primary pitch and you should define the sinker off of the cutter the thing that's weird for me is even on raw stuff which is has nothing to do with uh, it's not defined off the fastball. They give uh, Graham Ashcraft, this model gives uh, Graham Ashcraft 50 stuff plus on this cutter. So um, I do know that um, usually uh, there's a problem if it's a unique pitch, but uh, this reader is saying that it's the same. Let's see here 97, 0, and 5 for Ashcraft. And class A is 90, uh, 100, 1, and 5. I mean, that seems pretty similar. We're talking about one inch of horizontal movement difference between those two pitches. Class A does throw it three miles an hour harder, which is uh, obviously uh, important. Um, I have to say, man, some I think Ashcraft is just filed for me in pitchers we have to watch, pitchers that may in fact make us change the way we do the model or may, may you know, people that we, in the off season, we will be sort of testing uh, different things on. Um, but I also am not comfortable saying the model is incorrect because Grant and Ashcraft uh, looks so good and your model is dumb because uh, he also has a 6K9, you know, and a uh, poor swing strike rate. Um, and is not getting the same results as Class A either. You know, he's a weird pitcher. The results have been so good throughout most of his time in the minors. The walk rate being career best in the big leagues so far, with the K rate being by far the career worst. I, I, I don't know what to make of it just yet. I think it's needs more info. Uh, yeah, if, if That's you want to speculate in a really deep league, like sure, <laughs> I, I get it. Go ahead. Like he. He's certainly interesting. And I think when Clay Link stepped in while you were gone six weeks or so ago, there were, I think it was Kyle Farmer on the Reds who was talking about how they they thought maybe Ashcraft had the best pure stuff in their rotation, just in terms of velo and movement and being difficult to hit, difficult to see. I don't know if that was a, a little disrespect for Luis Castillo or just a lot of praise for, for Graham Ashcraft, but uh, I thought that was pretty interesting because I wouldn't have put Ashcraft in that conversation at the time. I would have thought both Castillo and Lodolo and Hunter Green were all probably ahead of him. So maybe he's just a guy we shouldn't be sleeping on. Here's a, a question for you. Is Corey Kluber just a younger version of Adam Wainwright at this point in his career? Yeah. 
No, I, it's not bad. There's there's another type of of player that you can get um, that is better than people think. I mean, he's throwing 105 stuff pluses out there at his age, and it's just almost all based on having one elite pitch, just like Wainwright. But if you have one elite pitch and then some other pitches that you can command. You know, I think it's a it's a model for decent. Uh, like, think about Zach Granke. Zach Granke, uh, you would think, nah. At this point, you know, it no. shouldn't work anymore, right? But he still has that one elite pitch, which for him is the power changeup. You know, and he can still, if he has that in his back pocket, the hitter's still. When's that coming? When's that coming? Oh, the, oh I should I sit on it? Oh, now he's filling it up the zone up with sliders. You know, so like you know, he's still crafty enough, and I think that's that's Kluber. I, I think you know, I have uh, Kluber and Syndergaard higher than the bat, and I think that's that's what I'm looking at when I when I'm when I'm looking at those two guys as guys with above average command a large arsenal they still have one or two good secondary pitches their fastballs aren't that great anymore but they they know how to dance around that and they don't throw the fastballs as much as they used to um so that's those are I think uh you know I think Noah Syndergaard belongs in that in that grouping and you know Adam Rainwright is right there. I have Tyler Anderson right there. I mean, that's that's the grouping of Kyle Gibson is right there. That's the grouping of you. You're a crafty dude, you know. Like you, you're good enough to throw out there most of the time. Here's another one. A pretty big faller, Lucas Giolito, now sitting at 74th in your rankings. Puts him behind Plesac. Puts him behind Sonny Gray. Puts him one spot ahead of Kyle Gibson. That is a massive, massive drop for Giolito. I think it's almost a two-part question. It's kind of a, obviously, this is how you feel about him now. Is it fixable in the offseason? Can Giolito get into a pitching lab and make some changes to reverse this and get back at least up into the top 30 among starting pitchers at some point in 2023? Yeah, I think it's possible the model uh, is missing something on his changeup a little bit because I don't think the model has ever really loved his changeup. And he does have a, a kind of a unique changeup that he throws in unique locations. He's got this kind of straight change that he throws high in the zone. The model still says it's right now, it's still a 105 stuff plus uh, pitch, but maybe it's an elite changeup. You know, it's pretty close to an elite changeup. So everything uh the model says that everything is on the four seam fastball he's got to get the ride back and for a little bit it looked like he was getting the ride back and then he wasn't so i think uh, you know he since he's shown that ride on the four seam in the past i think he can get it back once he gets it back i think he'll be an interesting buy low candidate next year um i you know depending on what the price is i will probably have some shares again uh, if we're buying him as a three or a four because he has the opportunity to be a two and a one again uh, but right now, this season, he's on the list of the top 30 stuff plus losers. Um, and uh, since we did the positive side, I'm going to run through the bottom <laughs> of this real quick. Sean Manaya. Oh. Uh, his release point has been dropping. His stuff plus is down to 78 in his last 400. Something is not right under the hood. Michael Kopetic is second. He uh, is also, I think, you know, everything is d- way down. His stuff plus is down 10 points. And um, I just, I see some velo droppage. I just see, uh, you know, there's a, just a possibility there's something wrong health wise because he's had issues health wise in the past. Bruce Zimmerman, uh, not, I didn't even rank him because his stuff plus had dropped so far. You say Kikuchi, uh, but. Uh, I'll put an asterisk around that because the 400 pitches is around an IL stint and he came back with a different slider. So uh, that's something I would just sort of monitor because I think he looks a little better with a different slider. Nick Pavetta, I think, has been obviously falling off. Maybe it's just fatigue. It's one of his longer seasons, I think. Uh, Mackenzie Gore, we know there was an injury. Uh, Spencer Strider dropped a lot, but that was because he was so high up as a reliever and he's still so high up as a starter. I, I tend to just like the next guy, Paulo Espino is also down and he's also a role changer. I'm a little bit more worried because Paulo Espino had a one Oh two stuff plus to start. So when you're throwing him now into the rotation, he's down to 94 in the rotation. He's a borderline start. He's kind of like a, um, I consider him a, a, a matchups guy. Logan Webb is next. 
Um, and I think you're, I think we've seen it in the results. The results are, are falling off. I don't know. I don't pretend to know what it is, but I've seen his VLO go down. Um, and, uh, it seems like his stuff is, is dropping. Mike Miner, uh, didn't even rank him. Herman Marquez, uh, you know, sometimes the schedule can just screw him. Alec Manoa was a big stuff plus dropper, uh, in the, in the top 12 and, and, and dropper. So, um, I don't know. That was pre-injury too. So, I I tended to just you know he the bat rank for him was twenty I just kind of kept him close to his bat rank in the rankings. Yeah, Kopech of the names you mentioned, the Kopech drop is probably one of the more troubling drops because he's trying to go through his first full big league season as a starter. The K rate is back down quite a bit compared to where it was a season ago, twenty one point four percent. He's walking guys. Home runs are a little bit of an issue, not terrible, right, right around a league average home run rate. But not surprisingly, you know, moving back into the rotation, the fastball velo is down, and it just doesn't seem like this arsenal is quite good enough like, right now. And I don't know if there's more for him to build he's on, or if this 94. is more of what you see or what you can get. He's down to ninety four this month. That's that's really low. Uh, you know, I mean, because he's not a guy who has command, right? Right. I mean, we just we know that about him. He has, I think, I saw on today on MLB Network, he has like the highest walk rate among qualified starters or something. Twelve point three percent. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, you know, I'm really worried about him. I think if you could uh, send Kopech in uh, a dynasty league, if you're contending, uh, I think the one of the one of the best use cases would be to kind of trade him away uh, for win now help. I think I would be willing to do that. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I'm not really interested there. Uh, last player I wanted to ask you about from the rankings, Reed Detmers. Didn't crack the top 100 yet. Does seem like a different pitcher since coming back from that at brief time at AAA Salt Lake. The pitching model doesn't seem to be convinced that Reed Detmers is an entirely different pitcher. But coming off of a 12 strikeout performance over seven innings on Sunday, now has a 362 ERA, 105 whip for the season. 75 Ks in 82 innings, but at least six strikeouts in each of his last six starts. So what do you make of this version of Detmers compared to the initial version of Detmers we saw this season and even upon arrival last year? Uh, I like the new slider and he is on the stuff plus risers. It's only he's risen to 91, but I would say there's a little bit of an asterisk there. I think, you know, some of these changes he's made have been within the 400, you know, um, if you did like a last 200, you might catch, uh, more of what's going on with this new slider he's throwing. Um, and so, you know, I've got pitches per appearance. Let me see here. Uh, this one, this is the, not my favorite one to look through because that's like every player's pitch, every player's pitch and every appearance. <laughs> it seems really like a nice list. One. Yeah. It's a really big one. Um, and it's not showing me. Come on, Dad. Oh, uh, this is with Bard. I took Bard out. Okay. I was like, it's only Bard? What, what's going on here? All hey, right. Congrats so, to Daniel Bard, by the way, on that extension. Like I, yeah. And I actually am happy for him. And, and also, uh, I think that, you know, people were uh, kind of giving uh, the Rockies crap for it. And I'm not with that, man. I think it's a fine deal. He, has, he had the best stuff plus of any uh, uh, reliever that was available at the deadline. And who cares that he's 38? It's a two year deal. You know, I, 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 I was into that. I thought it was a fine deal. Um, Detmer's slider is, is legitimately better uh, since he changed it. Since he came back up and in July, it's now uh, in the 130s and 150s. So you might be a little bit more of a guy who has the one elite pitch, but he does still throw the other pitches. And so, you know, I, I do think his ultimate upside comes from you know, maybe uh, looking at his four seam fastball shape because his four seam fastball stuff is, uh, you know, in the 60s sometimes, but floats in the 80s. So if he can, if he can improve his fastball shape, he, I think this new slider he's throwing is elite. So, uh, you know, and that's only, that's only on a level of three starts. So the 400 start thing is capturing some of that, but not all of that. Um, and so maybe I didn't, I didn't, uh, rank him very high, but I did rank him 111 and the bat had him 127. So I did push him a little bit based on that change in slider stuff. And, 
you know, I've, I'm never going to be the high guy in Detmers uh, across the industry. There are people who've been uh, pounding uh, the table f- about him. And, you know, it's been a pretty good outcome for this season. But I'm mostly excited about the new slider than I am about anything he did before. Yeah, I gave up on him in a lot of places and got him back in a few, but not as many as I would have liked and been pretty happy with what he's done so far. But if he had, if he's a top 75 starter the rest of the way and in the next season, that's still useful. It's just a case of making sure you don't put him in for the difficult spots. And so far, he's been good with some difficult spots since coming back with that new slider. That's been the killer is like you look at it and you say, am I going to use him? For his home starts against Houston, eh, probably not. Pitches pretty well there. On the road against Atlanta, eh, five scoreless innings, six Ks, and a win. So sometimes, you know, you're going to get bit playing the matchups and being safe. You would have had him in probably for the home matchup against the Rangers on Sunday, and that's been the best start that we've seen from him since that no-hitter. Probably even a better start in the sense that he had 12 Ks, and the no-hitter was almost almost without strikeouts entirely back when he did that earlier this season. Oh. Look at this, dude. Since he switched sliders, and you can see it very clearly where he switched sliders. You just look at the movement profiles. It's switched on July 8th. Since he switched sliders, he has a 1-1-3 ERA with a 12K per nine and three walks per nine. 31 strikeouts in 24 innings. Yeah, just different, like a totally different guy. Yeah. I mean, that's. I think that's what you're looking for um, when you're when you're looking at these guys. Like, You know, Austin Voth is a guy that we've liked uh, a little bit on this podcast in the past, and he's finally been, you know, put into a starting role uh, in Baltimore. And, uh, you know, you can see that his pitch usage uh, has has changed pretty dramatically um, with uh, with Baltimore Um, and, uh, you know, more curves and fewer cutters. Um, And from watching, I think. it, it seems to be working. It's a little bit more of a borderline case. It's not as exciting maybe as Detmers, uh, but I have him, uh, you know, five or six behind Detmers as a another guy that the rank, the projections really don't like. Um, the model likes a little bit and uh, is getting a chance and is changing, has changed his pitch mix. That's something I, I think that anybody can look for, you know, look for a, a dramatic change in results paired with a dramatic change in pitch mix and just be more likely to believe that a little bit. I just think we're, we're beginning to reach the point where the Orioles should be trusted when they add a pitcher. They can make a pitcher better. We're seeing that with Voth right now. I picked him up in a bunch of leagues, starting him in a bunch of leagues. It's a good start against the Pirates at home. Maybe he sticks around. Maybe he's a one-off streamer. We'll see. But I'm curious enough about what we've seen so far to take the chance on a stream and and possibly have him stick on some 15-team rosters a bit longer than expected. We need to go. Before we go, I will remind everyone you can get a subscription to The Athletic for just a dollar a month for the first six months at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. We have a live stream coming on Tuesday afternoon. We go live at 5.30 Eastern on The Athletic's main YouTube page. So yeah, it's like the equivalent of network TV, basically, to go on The Athletic's main YouTube page. That, of course, will be a podcast in The Athletic Baseball Show feed, our 3.0 episode for the week. You can find Eno on Twitter at Eno Saris. You can find me at Derek Van Riper. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We're back with you on Thursday. Thanks for listening.